Assalamualaikum and greetings of peace. My name is Safir Ahmed and I'm an editor at Renovatio, the journal of Zaytuna College. The core content of Renovatio is articles written by scholars, theologians, and writers, but we also strive to contextualize the topics they write about through interviews and conversations with the authors. We have with us today Dr. Mark Delp, who wrote an article titled Beware What Comes Within From Without which we will briefly discuss in a little bit. His thesis is that the habitual viewing of digital images on our desktops, on our laptops, on our smartphones, is destroying the stillness of heart that is a prerequisite for seeing God within our souls. Dr. Delp is a dean of faculty at Zaytuna College, where he also teaches philosophy and logic courses. As a specialist in the late antique and medieval periods, Dr. Delft's research interests include formal and material logic, as well as the history of Christian philosophy. Dr. Delft, your article is about the bombardment of digital images and what that may be doing to our inner selves. What prompted you to write about this topic? Um, in searching for a topic um, that, um, that related um, deeply to the theme of the of the Renovatio journal that we were, we've been talking about, which was metaphysical crisis, mm -hmm. I was seeking something that was very personal, um, something that would uh, not so be so much about general principles of the way society has changed, um, especially since the technological revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and I remembered a text that I was introduced to uh, in 1985. Um, called the Philokalia. Uh, uh, it was in a class uh, at San Francisco State, and I wrote a paper on it called Spiritual Empiricism. Mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, just a short paper. Um, the reason I named it Spiritual Empiricism was because um, the Philokalia is filled with texts on contemplation um, and monastic discipline um, uh, of a kind that I'd never encountered before, and I'd read a lot of mystical texts before, but um, this particular one was so very untheoretical. Um, it was not at all, and it didn't, it didn't have any um, rhetorical flourishes that some mystical texts have. They, did, did, they didn't play with words. They didn't, they didn't try to make things difficult to understand. They weren't um, using language that was inaccessible at all. They, and yet the entire landscape of um, the descriptive endeavor was internal and um, involved a concreteness in terms of um, its descriptions of what happens in the soul when one actually attempts to achieve a degree of quietude, which also means attaining a heart that beats, uh, achieving the, or I should say attaining um, a heartbeat mm -hmm. that is even, it's a, there's a physical element to it, um, but also a sense of quietude of intellect, what they call intellect, a noose. Um, and so, the, um, so there, there's a general landscape that they describe. It's entirely internal. It has to do with the emotions, the intellect, but it also has to do with um, something that we're not used to hearing. And when I eventually taught the, the book, mm -hmm. Uh, in a summer course at University of San Francisco, I was a little nervous because of its intensity, um, because of the of the, um, the almost ferocity of the um, um, the the ferocity of the the language. Um, they talked about the experience the uh, the experience of um, prayer in terms of spiritual warfare. And um, this spiritual warfare is pretty graphic. It doesn't involve any profanity, no sex, no, <laughs> no, no real violence, but it involves a, a kind of descriptive violence that goes on inside that's quite scary. Um, and, and a lot of the philokalia you 
quote in your article is about uh, protecting yourself mm -hmm. from the idea what what what, what you're taking in, mm -hmm. right? So talk about that. What, what exactly is are they talking about in that monastic tradition to protect yourself from? Well, this is one of the reasons I chose it because it dawned on me that when people view digital in images and often imitate a, a state of near total solitude, except for the machine, except for the device, mm -hmm. um, they're in a particularly unprotected unprotected um, state. Um, we presume that everything that comes in through the device, if it's not explicitly violent, if it doesn't violate any, any um, general modern social norms as to what would be acceptable or unacceptable to view mm -hmm. uh, for anybody, um, that it's neutral. It's morally neutral, as I say. Right. But um, um, uh, um, the, the, what I was saying is what, what interested me is that it didn't seem, it doesn't seem that most of us today consider that we have something precious in the soul to protect mm. in the first place, you see. Right, right. And so for them, this was just, this was a fundamental axiom of the experience. They in fact went into the desert not to find something to protect, but because they had something to protect. Some core part of their soul, which they called the heart, right, which was that organ, uh, and sometimes they would call it the intellect, they use the intellect and the heart almost inter interchangeably, but that particular part of the self, a spiritual part, an immaterial part, but something that felt that was mostly not seen, right, but that they mm -hmm. went to see more clearly, but it was the core of ourselves, the very core, you could, right. we say soul, some mm -hmm. people say self, but they didn't really meant, you know, they, they didn't have a word for self like we did. Right. They had a reflective that said, would say myself, but they didn't, they didn't have a word that said self with the solidity and concreteness that we usually think of the term. Right. So that they, um, um, so they already knew what they needed to protect. But in that age, in that time period, what exactly were they protecting themselves from? It wasn't a, well, you could say, they would say it didn't matter what age you would, you would Live had in. lived in. You okay. have a soul, everyone always has had right. a soul. Every right. human being's had a soul. Um, yeah. They're simply acknowledging it in a different way and adopting different methods to, to cultivate it, to care right. for it. So the sense is, is that everyone in all, you know, every, I, I believe that every civilization, every group of, every organized group of people going back to hunter gatherers knew, felt, I should say, they, they felt and thought that there was something in themselves mm -hmm. that was their core, that was precious, that they needed to, uh, that had to do with their gods in the afterlife. It was that that could, and it was that alone that, that they needed to preserve. The body could die, mm -hmm. they could suffer shame, they could, um, but there was something that, that, was, that was intimate, an, an intimate relationship between themselves and their creator. And almost, and virtually everybody believed that there was a creator. So, but what I, what I, what really I focused on amidst all the, the, um, the, attacks on religion or just simply the indifference to religion and the gradual rendering irrelevant of religion in our society and it's kind of on an upswing um, that what do you choose you know what do you choose to, to focus on as the importance of religion of religion and I was saying just the idea that there's something spiritually precious in yourself that you don't see but you feel and that push comes to shove as used to say what it, what's this the phrase um, there are no atheists in the foxholes. Is that it? The foxholes, or the no atheists in the in the in the trenches. Trenches, yeah. So that when serious experiences happen, they start to find it. Mm -hmm. And so this is where I talk about um, uh, the the monks uh, referring to uh, the value of the of um, the attacks they talk about on this special place. Because the extent that one realizes that it's being attacked, one, one realizes more clearly what it is and how precious it, it is, often only when it's endangered. Um, back to uh, this issue of, of technology itself, your concern, you're prompted by this, what we're doing today, and your concern seems to be that technology is sort of what it's enabling in modern culture. 
Um, do you believe that technology is sort of taking us away from reality, for instance? Um, depends on what you mean by reality, and that's the Take, problem. Tell us what, what, you, what, you, what you think it means. A reality? Yeah. How would you define that? Well, first I'd like to say that the problem is we don't communally have a sense of what it means. Mm -hmm. So if I were to define it to you, um, someone might say, oh, interesting concept of reality you have, right? Right, right. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, we use the term very loosely. Mm -hmm. um, there, in, in, there's no consistent, I should say, there's real, no really, I'll just have to say, there's no real deep and profound concern with the term anymore mm -hmm. in philosophy. It's a very one-dimensional thing. Reality simply means the sense world. Right. That's been that way for a long time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you say something in school of logical positivism, you can only, you know, the test for whether you, what you're saying is right. not nonsense, that makes sense, is to what degree it can be verified in sense experience. Right. But, you know, the term empirical um, comes from the Greek um, uh, empiros, and mm -hmm. It means, it means um, experience. And so who's to say what's experience or not? Generally, I would say that reality, um, you, could, you could define reality in a preliminary, with, in a pre preliminary way as something experienced um, intensely and with a great deal of presence that, that, can, that, that, uh, that engages you um, beyond the level of the senses and penetrates mm -hmm. to the deeper places of your soul. And you, so in that, with that definition, would you consider digital images have the capacity to do that? To, to penetrate. Penetrate, yes. Absolutely. The, uh, absolutely. And so that, what you, when we look at our smartphones, when we look at, at um, our laptops and watch images, watch videos, things like that, is that the reality we're, we're, we're taking? Is that also a different form of reality, the way you, you're looking at to it? To that extent, no? you know, in the definition I just gave, it's very real. Right. Because what's happening is um, real Im re images that are there, mm -hmm. right, and are moving, mm -hmm. right, um, they're moving on the screen, and then they move within our imaginations. Right. They move first, of course, on the retina. They come in through the senses, and also we hear them. Um, and then they become part of our inner landscape. And that's extremely real. And then, as I say in the paper, they come in intelligently. They're not, they don't come in as a searchlight, say, at a parking lot, might come into your eyes and, and, and hurt your eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, the light comes in and that's it. Right. These images come in pre-programmed um, with a message. Right. And so they're actually, you know, uh, the Philokalia, uh, the monks in the, uh, uh, who wrote the treatises of Philo, the Philokalia, were looking at, they were, they were being challenged by images of their own imaginations from memories mm -hmm. when they lived in the cities, for example, but, or images that would simply come into their minds by the, by, uh, the agency of what they, they considered demonic provocations because they went out to the desert because the desert was renowned for its spirituality, for its, but it also for its strangeness and for the, the different kinds of spirits that were out there. And so when the, so their, their images came from other spirits and they, so that because that the images that would come in and tempt them mm -hmm. were, were clearly, they perceived them as clearly intelligent. They were, they were attacking them right. and they were clever. And they came with discourses, not just images. And so um, we would say that we would give other, other explanations for this today. Mm -hmm. but they thought that it was clearly something that was coming in from the outside. The same thing happens with these. We all know that images come, they come with subliminal, subliminal messages. They give mm -hmm. us messages in the way they move on the screen, that movement enters inside of us. The movement itself has a message and, a, and, a, and an emotional the movement itself of the image has an emotional message without even, regardless of what it's saying. Right. There's so much stimuli and there's, there's so many, um, there's so much data, mm -hmm. right, coming in on some of these images that we, we don't catch 
fraction of it. And it, once it gets in, it continues to move. Right. right. Uh, un, you know, usually unnoticed in our imaginations, and in our imaginations it settles in our memories, right. and it becomes the grist for contemplation, good or bad. Now the conventional wisdom has been, in social sciences particularly, that the images that come in, the ones that are really bad for you are the violent ones, or the pornographic ones, or you know, things that are not good to intake. But the rest of it, even advertising, is seen as benign and sort of perfectly fine to you know, ingest, if you will. Mm -hmm. You don't buy that, do you? I think that there's a lot to consider besides the image itself. Mm -hmm. That's a primitive way of looking at what's going on, and they know it, right? <laughs> I mean, they, they, that would be very good for them if that's all we thought. Right, right. Um, but in, you know, corporate advertising has, been, has become extremely sophisticated. And so what we're talking about is not just the image itself, but um, like I said, the way it moves. Mm -hmm. um, a, just a simple movement of something can be erotic. It can be subtly erotic. A simple movement can imply a, a, a threat of violence, even in a cartoon. Right. Um, you know, you have, um, you have things that, uh, for example, the good content. We call it the good content, right. right? You'll see, and this is just as general knowledge. You know, they'll rep, you'll get a report on a news site of mm -hmm. some atrocity. How will how will it be reported? You know, will it be subtly sentimentalized? Right. Who's going to be talking about it? Is the person even conscious of the seriousness of it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that um, what did they decide to show? What's it supposed supposed to stick in our memory? And then. Another example, which is again very old, CNN, for example, covers exhaustively um, the um, second Iraq war. Mm -hmm. It, for 12, I don't know, for 24 hours, 48 hours, they had no commercials. Right. And then all of a sudden, from this, this utmost serious and really nightmare scenario, um, you get the first commercial. And the thing, the 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 illusion is is shattered. Are they really seriously? Who's serious about this? Why is it being shown? Mm -hmm. You can't separate the the stupid commercial that comes after it. How can we tolerate that? Right. And so those things have it. You know, they they confuse the mind. And then I'll, I'll, I'll just one more example is the sheer fragmentation, the the continual, relentless fragmentation. Mm -hmm. of the screen by these images that have no intrinsic relation to each other. The constant stream conveys a lack of continuity. It conveys a powerful lack of unity mm -hmm. in the message. And we don't realize that hours and hours and hours of, visu of, 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 of um, gazing at a spectacle of chaos, of chaotic movement, of unrelated multitudinous images, often in a state of conflict, often not, but whatever, um, what you're really seeing is, a, is, what you're getting is a bombardment of a fragmented mind. So it's it almost is looking, looking at a, it's looking at a schizophrenic and full, sort of full freak out. Yeah, I mean, the one aspect that uh, comes to my mind about that um, images and the, the sort of, you know, uh, blend and the cacophony of images that you're talking about that come at you. Um, there are images one would think that you see that actually incite compassion in you, for instance, or mercy in you. Um, how do you, I mean, those are, are those okay? Are those fine? Or, or, or do, you know, in the context of what you were just talking about, do, wouldn't you, wouldn't we want to have things that actually engender those, those emotions and those feelings in us and those yes. parts of us. Yeah, I think there, there are things, mm -hmm. you know, there are. Um, there have been good things on television, there have been good things in right. the movies. Right. But the problem is, is that they don't alleviate the general situation. They're the exception, mm -hmm. and they don't change the character of the whole. So do you, so the problem is, um, well, I think those are getting increasingly difficult to find, but you could, I could say, so what, right? right. There are good things. Right. right. 
doesn't change the fact that, you know, um, when you're interacting with a cell phone mm -hmm. or with a, a laptop browsing the internet for the most part, um, I don't think that it, it can affect, it can, it can, if that's what you mean, I don't think, one, it justifies mm -hmm. the general harm that I'm claiming that happens. Right, right. And two, it certainly doesn't have the power to mitigate it or to soften it or to, to, um, to contribute to any significant healing that one might need. Although one can see something very moving on the internet right. and, and carry away with one a sense of, of beauty or solemnity, mm -hmm. right? You do. And what would you suggest as a path forward? I mean, for people, what, how do you do it yourself? And what would you suggest for the rest of us in terms of how do you mitigate the impact of these things and what, of the images that are coming at us? How do you manage that? I'm not sure if it's possible if you don't recognize that there's something that needs to be protected. Right. Assuming you do. I mean, we're assuming you do recognize Well, then, if you're assuming you do, you probably have some religious background because mm -hmm. um, the degree of self-awareness I'm talking about really usually comes from a fairly sophisticated source. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I wrote the paper predominantly for religious people because it's something religious people don't speak about. Right. And so if a religious person loses a sense that there's something precious what about the rest of us? You know, so I'm, I do think that the, the acknowledgement and the, the, the um, verification, internal verification, that there's something that can, be, that can be fragmented, something one that can be fragmented and then lose its, its vitality in its life, um, that there is something that, 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 uh, to which that can happen and that one feels it deeply with a spontaneous and... and unself-conscious um, sense of urgency mm -hmm. is, is really, really important because otherwise, what do you, how do you even start protecting? You're, you're asking me how you protect yourself. Right. Well, I'm asking you, what, to, what do we need to protect? Right. It's, it's that precious thing. So I, I just would say that you just, you have to take what religion says mm -hmm. very seriously and then um, in your own religion, look at the kinds of texts that deal with this very thing in, you know, whether it's 100 years ago or 1,000 or 2,000, right. um, they're talking, what my point is, is that there's a real analogy going on here. A real analogy. Mm. It's, it's a real analogy. It just, now, what you're, what, what's going on is the images that we're being flooded with are equally as hostile. Equal, you see, they don't, the images don't care about the unity of your soul. Right. They're after, uh, you know, your money, right. they're after your soul. Yeah. Because the whole point is that the images, when they come in, they start to form you. They start to shape the soul. Mm -hmm. if the whole point of the Philokalia message is that if you, don't sh if you don't resist them and consciously realize they're there and reject them, right. it, will, it will shape the inner life, your inner right. life. And that will become the face of yourself to yourself. Right. And you will not have your own. And so, most people passively sort of Take it in without Absolutely. really because, resisting it. Because yeah. they're, not, they're not told that. We also, we all, we're always told, find yourself, go find yourself. Right. But we're always told what that self is. Right. Whatever people go to find, it's usually something they've already seen on a movie or a magazine. But, right. but you need to have, so where do you go to find what yourself is? I believe you go to the, the deepest, most traditional, the most tried and true religious texts. Mm -hmm. That is simply my own conclusion. Yeah. That the, the, this tradition is the, the tradition of these texts is over a thousand. They were being written over a thousand years. A thousand years. Mm -hmm. The tradition of this spirituality goes back farther than the fourth century, right. and has lasted all the way up to the present time in the Christian East. Um, before we wrap up, I want to ask you uh, to sort of broaden this out a little bit and ask you about a larger topic, which is also the theme or the, you know, um, uh, something that's the kind of driving Renovatio itself, which is the issue of metaphysics, as you mentioned. Um, can you, I know this is an, sort of an almost an impossible task in that short interview, but can you talk about briefly about the importance of having metaphysics and, and the metaphysical view of looking at things, and, and especially in the times we live in? Um, 
So let's define metaphysics just um, as it may be most relevant today. Mm -hmm. And that is a discipline by which we, we seek myth methodically to discover the most fundamental, our most fundamental presuppositions about the world and ourselves. Right? The most fundamental. And that would mean if you were to do it as a project, you would seek to find in yourself and others and in the nature of the phenomena, we, we, social phenomena that we encounter, what do we all presume mm -hmm. to be real? That we, what, do, what do we all presume and not question? Right. And if we did that, we would find some interesting things, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then you'd also find a lot, of, a lot of profound differences. And you would likely discover that, you know, as a society, we don't agree on most of those things. Um, but so if you did, you'd, you would see that, um, well, I think, the, I think the project itself would be extremely valuable to know what, what aren't you seeing, mm -hmm. what aren't you paying attention to, and what is no one else paying attention to that's right. actually happening. We're formed from the bottom up. So many things happen in society that no one votes on. Did you vote for the McDonald's coming next to you, uh, build, right. being built next to you on the corner? Right. I mean, in the 60s, people tried to keep McDonald's away, right? <laughs> but um, did they, I mean, how many things do you really vote for right. that actually happen? Who voted for this massive technological, uh, um, this massive te technological um, wave mm -hmm. to sweep over society and quite clearly change almost everything? Yeah. Who, you know, my wife never had a vote to be right. subjected to upgrades <laughs> virtually every six months or a year that were extremely time consuming and very traumatic to learn and then only be changed a year later. Right. Who votes for this incessant change? We're supposed to like it. It's not up to us, right? There's so many of those things happening mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we simply do them because, well, a lot of people will say, no, I hate this. In the 60s or 70s, no. When, when, lap, when desktops first started to come out, yeah. they had a commercial. It was a secretary. Do you remember? Yes. She, yes. she, she she's, she's working, the then office. she backs yeah. off. And do you remember what she does? <laughs> no. She, I, she takes a sledgehammer and oh, that's right. destroys it, right? <laughs> I do remember that. Right? And yeah. nothing's really yeah. changed. In fact, it's just gotten right. worse. You know, the, the yeah. people really hate, yeah. hate technology. I mean, frankly, I think most people really hate most technology because it renders their life miserable. But this, we just accept it. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, why do we think it's inevitable? Well, we, people tell us it's inevitable. Right. So, but, but that's metaphysical. We're, we're, we're accepting deeply, paradigmatically significant. It, these, this is, and, and everyone admits it. You know, the tech people will say, we're changing the paradigm. This is their brag about it, right? right? But do you know what that means? Do you know how important that me is? When you don't even know yeah. what it is, you don't know what's happening. And then what is the paradigm doing? And if you don't see it, you won't know. And right now, well, what are they saying the paradigm is doing? It's changing the human being. Right. It's making it not other than human. It's making it transhuman, more than human. Right. Alien? I don't know. But everybody seems in a rush to get away from being human. And that's paradigm changing. Why is that happening? Because of structures that have been, that have been percolating up be you know under our vision, under mm -hmm. the vision, mm -hmm. under the radar for a long time, longer than we think, and now all of a sudden they're here. No one voted for them. No one had a council to say, should we do this? Should we do that? Right. right? And that and, you know, and it's all part of the capitalist paradigm too. It's laissez faire. And you attribute that to sort of a absence of metaphysical. Absolutely. We yeah. don't have a metaphysics. Uh, understanding of things. If you yeah. don't have a mes metaphysics, someone will give it to you, give one to you. Yeah. And, yeah. and at we, the ancient society, aboriginal societies, they knew exactly what their metaphysics was. Mm -hmm. They were constantly in touch with everything below and above them. They felt things coming out of the ground. They felt everything. And when something was changed, was changing, they were sensitive as cats to, 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 to determining what it was, right. you know? And Native Americans, they see Europeans, even the first, mm -hmm. their first thought, we were crazy. 
because we're not paying attention to what's around us, all the spiritual influences. They thought we were crazy, and yeah, we were. And, and, and what made them aware in those times, and what is it that is not ma doing that for us now? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a really, really deep question. It's like asking, what, you know, what, is the, what is the origin of, not technology, because mm -hmm. I never say I shun technology. I don't want, I don't, we can't shun it. Right. I, I think we should walk away gradually from it. I don't want to, I don't feel that nothing should be destroyed, you know. This is the, mm -hmm. you know, the, um, mm -hmm. um, I think that, but, but regardless, I think the answer lies in, um, Greek, the, the, the earliest Greek culture, in the, especially in the 5th and 6th century, 6th, mm -hmm. 5th century, that's where something happened. It has to do with technology, but, but it has a certain, it has a certain, uh, uh, it has something to do with what Nietzsche says in Twilight of the Gods, that um, in a certain type of theoretical or conceptual thinking, we distance ourselves, not irretrievably, but mm -hmm. we distance ourselves um, in an alienating way from nature. Right. And by nature, I simply mean the, the, the world that is, the world around us, the creatures of, or the right. beings around us that are not created by us, you could say right. that, right. that we didn't make. We have distanced ourselves from the vitality of nature and natural things, and also from um, the beauty uh, and the and the, really the shocking life of nature. We have separated mm -hmm. ourselves from other creatures, and somehow something about our rational processes have done this. And we live in a world of, of our own making now. Is that what you mean? Well, that's what it's ended up in. Yeah, we right. we're right now we're as surrounded in our own bubble as we ever have been. We've created a bubble where I think people can hardly, well, and you see in science fiction books and, and also futuristic, article, futuristic articles that people are ceasing to see objects as other than themselves, right. other, than, uh, other than things in their own imaginations. I mean, they can't walk out in a forest without thinking that these are simply um, Facebook opportunities. Right, right. So... Um, no, we're, we live, we've never lived ever before in such a human bubble to the extent that it, we risk not being able ever to get out of it. Do you, I mean, the way you describe it almost seems hopeless, right? Right. No, I don't think it's hopeless. So that's why I want to right. ask you, yeah. I think that there are, there are ruptures that take mm -hmm. place. I'm concerned that people do feel it. They feel frustrated. They don't know what... They, they may not think that they're surrounded by anything, but they feel intensely frustrated. They feel the stress and pressure of technology and, mm -hmm. and, and also the economic situation, and they relate the two. They've, they're actually, we're very still, we're very sensitive, we're very emotional savvy about what's going on. But it's how they choose to react to the situation and in, in violent ways and in ways that would want them to tear down what exists. And I, so I think we should walk away from it instead of tearing things down. But um, I, I, I believe that there are benevolent, benevolent, God-given ruptures all around, mm. all happening all around in, in a single person. You can just see a single person on the street and that, that one vision of that person will make you weep right. for some right. reason, right? right? And that's then the bubble's broken. And that's where the, all the sensitivity comes back in the way, right? Yeah, and the light. Yeah, and the light. And this is what the Philokalia were saying. To the extent that you resist, mm -hmm. resisting is light producing. Right. You know, right. to the extent that we keep our soul clear, we can actually see, right? We see right. Right. things like that. But if you don't keep your soul clear, you will never see that person. Um, on that note, I think we, we need to wrap up. We've barely skimmed the surface of everything. <laughs> I, I urge everybody to read the article that uh, Dr. Delp wrote. Again, um, it's called Beware of What Comes Within From Without. Um, thank you, Dr. Delp. Um, my name is Safir Ahmed with Renovatio, the Journal of Vitana College. Um, we'll see you again. Mm -hmm.
。